I'm not a crypto person, I'm a computational biologist. And in my talk, I'm going to present a gap, a gap for this community and about how to share genomic information in a safe, uh, in a safe way. So kind of like the way that I want to start my talk is that we need to share genomic information. If we want to help families with rare genetic disorders to understand the genetic basis of cancer, we need to share this data set. So just in my own group, because people shared genomic information, we were able to solve the genetic basis of three devastating pediatric disorders. And doesn't work this thing. Or no. Uh, three devastating pediatric disorders, including uh, uh, Joubert syndrome, that's a psychomotor retardation over there, and other disorders such as uh, hemifacial microsoma. You see this poor child over here. And the reason that we could do that was because healthy people shared their genome and we got the DNA from our patients. So then we can compare our patients, their genome, to the genomes of healthy individuals and by that exclude of like a multiple exam, we just exclude options, exclude mutations in these patient genomes until you identify the only mutation that caused the disease. So why am I interested in genetic privacy? This goes to the days that I was an undergraduate student and I worked in a computer security company as a vulnerability researcher. And since this was kind of like the early 2000s, I actually worked mainly on telephony systems, so freaking, if you remember the term. And what, I, what I'm going to show you now is one of my favorite hacks. So what you see over here, this is, this is me. And this is the door to the IT department of a major bank in Israel. And this door is controlled by a fingerprint reader over here, but also by a simple device just by an intercom. It's a very simple device. You press on the button, it calls the secretary, and if uh, uh, he knows you, he would press eight. This will open the relay so you can enter to the IT department. Currently, it is 10 p.m. In this, in this slide. No secretary in the building. And I'm going to show you how you can enter to this door in five seconds using your own cell phone or smartphone just by playing eight from outside. Now let's see if the audio will, will work and we can actually I can play you this movie. So I'm calling the secretary by pressing on the button. Dining eight and taking the money. Don't try this at home, by the way. <laughs> now, the point of this vulnerability research is that we can identify gaps in the security of this bank, and then we can go to the security manager of, the, of this bank and tell him about the, this gap so we can think together about how to move forward. My talk is structured after this, after this uh, uh, process. I'm going to present you in hack, and during the Q&A, I hope that we can discuss how we should move forward to bridge this gap. So you're going to become like the security managers of this bank. Okay, so let's talk about uh, genome hacking. We know for over a decade that there is a correlation between the Y chromosome and surnames. For instance, here we have a family, the Smith family. And this family, let's say that they have a son. The son gets his Y chromosome from his father. And in most Western societies, he will also get his surname. Where is Adam Smith? It's for you. And <laughs> now, this, if this son is getting married, if Adam is getting married also as a son, he will also give him his Y chromosome and also his surname. So this starts to create a correlation between Y chromosome and the surnames. So there are genetic uh, genealogy companies that take advantage of this correlation, and they will send you a, a kit with a swab to sample DNA on your cheek. They will put, you will put this swab uh, in an envelope with 99 bucks, very important. You will send it to them, and then they will genotype a series of markers on the Y chromosome. These markers look like that. They're called short tandem repeats. Basically, they are kind of like, they, they can, uh, these repeats, the number of these repeats is different between different individuals. They just measure these repeats in multiple locations on the Y chromosome and put it on a database that is available online and together with the surname of the individual. And what you see over here are my own test results. Ehrlich. I was tested, and here are my own test results. The reason that people do these tests, it's because it's a lot of fun. 
you can actually uh, find uh, your patrilineal relatives. You can learn about So this is the reason why many people actually uh, are excited about these tests. Okay, so the purpose of our study is to conduct this systematic investigation to see if I can use these databases, I can use this correlation between the Y chromosome and the surnames to breach the, the privacy of, um, of uh, whole genome sequencing data that are allegedly anonymous without any identifiers. Okay, so we decided to focus on two databases, smgf.org and ysearch.org. Both databases uh, were, uh, are publicly available online and they contain, they contain the records of 140,000 individuals. So we have surnames and the Y chromosome combination. And how should you find a surname? So we estimate a surname based on the time to the most recent common ancestor. So what we're going to do, we have the target, we have the DNA of the person that we want to breach is privacy, Adam in our case, and we're going to take all the records in the database and to compare, to basically measure the distance, the time between these two Y chromosomes to their shared ancestor. How do we do that? Using evolutionary approaches, I will not go into the algorithm, but it's a fairly simple process. The take home message is that if the time, if I measure these two Y chromosomes, if the time is very ancient, multiple generations, let's say goes to the 2,000 years ago, we say, you know what, probably they don't share, these two individuals don't share the same surname because at that point 2,000 years ago, it was before the invention of the surname system. But if these two individuals have a very recent common ancestor, let's say they are in the order of third, fourth, fifth cousins of each other, we have higher likelihood that they share the same surname. Okay, so that's... Yeah. So we have, let's say that we have a database of, you want to repeat the question to the microphone? Thank you, I'm, I'm just gonna interrupt. Please uh, wait for the microphone to be passed around. If you're going to ask a question, we wanna record your wonderful questions. Uh, sorry, I was just going to ask, I thought, to, you know, you only have database of people like in the last like five years. So I'm not sure how you're going to get the yeah. Here, let, let me clarify. Let's say that I have a database of all the people in the room, yeah. and we have some anonymous DNA that we know it's Adam, but we need to recover his identity. Our Y chromosome, the relationship between our Y chromosomes of all the males in this room, we have, for, for sure, we have some shared ancestors, right? At some point, there was a shared father between the two of us, if we go deep enough. Maybe 50,000 years ago, maybe 10,000 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, right? What we do, we just take the Y chromosome and we measure this time between when was the shared ancestor lived. We have an estimator, it's not like precise, it's a distribution, but we just take the mean of this distribution. Okay, simple as that. Okay, so more questions? Good. So what we did, we took this, uh, we, we took uh, people that we know their surname and we have the Y chromosome and we query these two databases that are available online. We use our algorithm to find the most likely surname and then we, after we infer the surname, we check to see if the surname was the right surname, if it matches what we expected. We repeated this process more than 900 times with 900 different individuals to gain statistical power. And what we found was that for US Caucasian males, we have 12% successful recoveries of the surname, and in most cases, our algorithm says, I don't know. The distance is too large to infer any uh, um, likely surname. But 12% successful recoveries. And you might ask, okay, but well, 12% is very low. But think about it, if I have a database of one million individuals, and this is something that the NIH announced recently, to build a database of one million DNA samples, it means that I can get more than 100,000 successful surname recoveries to bridge the identity of these people. Okay, another question is, you know what, maybe I just get all these common surnames, Smith, right? And that doesn't give a lot of information because there are so many people with, with common, like, with, that would match a common surname. But in fact, what we get in this process are the relatively rare surnames. So this is a distribution of the surname frequency in the US and how much successful recoveries we have. So on average, this process of recovering the surname 
reduces the search space by 5,000 fold. Okay, so if I start with 310 million individuals in the US, by the Y chromosome, I know this is a male. I go to 160 million individuals or something like that. And then by the surname, I go to a group of about 40,000 individuals. OK, but then you can ask and say, who cares, 40,000 individuals? Can you really get to a single individual? And the answer is yes. And the trick is that I can combine other types of identifiers that are not protected by the HIPAA privacy rule. So age and state, for instance, are two identifiers that the HIPAA privacy rule says that you can publish as part of your, dat of your data set. They're not considered protected identifiers. So the question is, if I recovered the age, state, and the surname, how many people would match to such a profile? So let's, we, what we did, we, we did a simulation using the US census data. We look at the distribution of ages in the US, the number of people in each state. We also took the covariance between age and state because in Florida, people are all there. We took that into account, just how to show in a two-dimensional slide. So let's say we took someone that is age of 40, uh, is a state, is a Colorado, and surname is Adams. And we ask how many males would match such a profile. Repeated this simulation, 100,000 rounds. We found that if I have the age, state, and surname, I get the median size of my list is 12 males. When I have 12 males, at that point, I can have any other piece of information would allow me to identify the individual. You know what, I can even use social engineering. I can call each one of these 12 males and ask them, did you participate in a genetic study? Maybe not me, but someone with a nice accent can be more convincing, but in general, that could work. Okay, so far I show you this process by pieces, by simulations of different pieces. And you can ask, okay, this is very nice, but can you put it all together? Can you show us one example that it works? And the answer is yes. We took the genome of Craig Venter from the NCBI database. We recovered the STRs on his Y chromosome, this short term repeats, using Lobster. This is an algorithm we developed in my group for a different uh, project a few years ago. The paper is available in Genome Research. And here is an example, real example from, from Craig Venter's data. For a marker called DYS458 on the Y chromosome, we found 17 repeats, and these are the four sequencing reads that support, that came from Craig Venter genome, that are 17 repeats. Then we went to ysearch.org, to the search mechanism, let me zoom in, and for each marker, we just put the number of repeats that we identified. And then we clicked search. And after a few seconds, this is what the database gave us. Venter was the top match. So you might want to replicate our own study, so you can go to this link, bit.ly slash findcraig, and this will redirect you to this search uh, mechanism with all the alleles that we found in Craig Venter Y chromosome. Click on the search button from your computer right now and see that you get Craig Venter. There are no tricks over here. If you have an internet connection and some knowledge in genetics, you can do this process. So let me just summarize this slide. We got a surname from whole genome sequencing data from a public resource. But the, you know, we, we got Venter, right? And the question, can we get to Craig Venter? So we took this surname Venter, and then we said, okay, we know that this guy lives in California, was born in 1946 and a male. We put all this information in ussearch.com. This is a public record uh, search engine, and you can put all these identifiers. It's quite, quite amazing what you can find. <laughs> so I just showed you how we can go all the way from whole genome sequencing data to the identity of someone, Craig Venter. But then you can ask, okay, and if you know what, that's, it's, yeah, it's nice. But when you started this process, you already knew that Craig Vent, the genome of Craig Venter belongs to Craig Venter. So the, main ch the real challenge, what we really want, is to see if we can take people that I don't know a priori, their identity, and see if I can identify using this algorithm. Let's see if it works. So we decided to focus on the Thousand Genomes Project. This is the flagship project of the NIH to generate large, like whole genome sequencing data, put it on Amazon Cloud so everyone can download this data set. The data is allegedly de-identified. Doesn't give you the names of these individuals, but you have their ages, you have their state, and you also have some pedigree structure for these individuals. 
So we took 10 uh, genomes from the, what's called the CEU collection. This is the kind of like the uh, United States uh, uh, collection as part of the 1,000 genomes that is a global project with genomes from all over the world. These genomes are from Utah. And we use Lobster to recover the STRs in these genomes. We infer the surname using the same process that I showed you before, and we got certain predictions for these genomes. Interestingly, in eight out of the 10 cases, the surname had an ancestor in Utah, which was interesting because we knew that they are from Utah. But did we get the right people? So we first, we focus on this pedigree over here. If you didn't see a pedigree in your life, squares means males, circles means females, okay? And here we have a pedigree of three different generations. We recover the surname of the ancestral grandfather, or of the paternal grandfather and the maternal grandfather. And we don't give the exact details of this pedigree just to respect the privacy of this family. So I don't give the number of kids and the order of males and females. Then we took the surnames that we recovered. We went to our favorite tool called Google. And we just, we did some very similar uh, query to what I show you over here. And what we found, the top match, the top hit, was an obituary from a family in Utah. And all the details in this obituary matched what we know about this pedigree in the 1,000 genomes. The surname of the maternal grandmother matched the maiden name of the mother. The surname of the paternal grandfather matched the father's surname in this obituary. All the ages were the same. This, pe this pedigree was, was from Utah. The number of kids was the same, and this is a very big pedigree. The birth order of males and females in this pedigree and obituary was exactly the same. Think about it, it's like flipping a coin multiple times and be able to predict these flips. And so we concluded that if I scan all households in the United States and ask, like, what is the probability of, of a false positive, it will be less than five times 10 to the minus nine that I found the wrong family, based on all the details we have. Very low probability. So then we submitted the paper, and it was rejected because the reviewer said, you just showed that on one pedigree. Can you, can you replicate? Maybe it was beginner's luck. So we said, yes, let's do that again. And again, so we just recovered more and more uh, families in the 1,000 genomes, and then we just got bored after the third family and said, okay, that's enough. And in all cases, we recovered the identity of these individuals with very low probability after scanning all households in the United States. In fact, we had so much information at that point that we could see we, what is the relationship between the families in the 1,000 genomes that we recovered their identity and between the people that participated in the genealogical study. Very important, these are not the same people. Here, we have the second cousin once removed of this family that participated in this fun process of genetic genealogy, and by that, identified this entire family. Here we had also, it's like very complex genealogical relationships, but these are far relatives. How many of you know your second cousin once removed? How, do they, how many of you know if they participate in a genetic study? So in total, for, from this study, we were able to breach the privacy of close to 50 CU samples, all the samples here in Black, we know their Facebook accounts, we know their genome, we know some, sometimes also expression data, many different types of biological uh, um, data sets. Okay, so we published this paper in Science uh, three years ago, and also there was an NIH back-to-back uh, -back, uh, with an NIH policy forum that they wrote their perspective. What we did was kind of like the, the regular mechanism in uh, white hat hacking before we put this paper online. We notified the NIH about the study, about our finding. They asked us to delay the, the publication. We said yes. They had some meetings with them, think how to move forward, and then they put their own perspective, and then we published it back to back. And this was something that I think the community really liked, and uh, this is the editorial in Nature, so that this was an exemplary way to react to these privacy loopholes. It got also a lot of uh, uh, media attention, this study. And then after that, Arvin Arayanan and myself wrote this uh, review, Roots for Breaching and Protecting Genetic Privacy, where we systematically look at all the methods to breach genetic privacy and to think how we can protect the data. So one thing that will not work is to perturb the data. 
and or just to mask the data. And here is, uh, it's very hard to protect genetic information. Either you lose utility or you just don't protect. For instance, APOE is a gene in your genome that encodes for a higher likelihood for Alzheimer. And so if you have a certain variant over here, much higher likelihood that you will develop Alzheimer uh, in your late life. Now, um, Jim Watson, he was the second person that his genome was sequenced. Now, Jim Watson, the, no, he, from Watson and Crick, the guy that discovered the structure of the DNA, the guy that led the beginning of the Human Genome Project, one of the best known geneticists in the world. He knows DNA, right? We can agree that. Okay, so his genome was sequenced in 2007, and he said, you know what? I don't care about publishing my whole genome online. I just don't want my APOE status to be online. I want to mask it. So what they did, they masked the APOE from his genome. But some other researchers found that you can use what's called genetic imputation to impute back the missing piece. And I will not go over the details how it works, but you can think it's very similar, so you can basically restore the APOE status. So I would just say that genetic imputation works like text imputation very similarly. I guess everyone here can read this sentence. Can you? How can you? I just mask 50% of the, of the data. And you can read it because you already saw so many words, so many letters, you know how the English language should work, that you can impute back the data. The same thing with genetic imputation. Since we saw so many genomes already out there, we can go back and impute missing parts of new genomes that are masked. And this is how we can restore the APOE status. So there was a paper uh, by this group in, uh, that says, like, basically notified about the risk that they could restore the APOE status of, of Jim Watson. The only, I think, and I would love to hear your comments, but the only area that I, I think that there is a good consensus that encryption can protect genetic information while not destroying the utility is uh, outsourcing computation using homomorphic encryption. There is a wonderful work here um, I think, um, that allows you basically to take a genome, use homomorphic encryption to encrypt this genome, send it to an interpretation service that works on the ciphertext. Since in um, genomics our models are mainly linear, mainly additive, you can use a, a simple homomorphic encryption schemes, and then basically this interpretation service can do this uh, interpretation of the genome on the cipher, send it to the participant that can decrypt it and know what is the risk, and here is an example of uh, um, how it can work. And what I think in general that we should, you know, I want to hear your thought about it, but maybe we should just say, you know, privacy is very hard in genomics, Instead of focusing on privacy, let's focus on trust. Let's just try to build trust with our participants. And instead of promising them uh, vague promises or, or, or empty promises of privacy in genetic studies. And an example, we put a website called DNA Land where people can upload their genomic information. And i just tell you about this DNA Land. They can upload their genomic information and we consent them that they can participate in genetic research. And, and also we, can, we serve them some data about their ancestry about, uh, and about their genealogy. We, we launched this website two months ago. We got 10,000 genomes already. And we have very low promises of privacy for these participants. So maybe this is the right model. I don't know, I want to hear your feedback. Thank you very much.